Merry Christmas, if you will, stand with me. Help us sing, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold. it is to be in the house of the Lord and Merry Christmas to you and to your family. Thank you so much for being here today uh, and being a part of our Christmas service. We're excited about all that the Lord has in store for us uh, today, but the blessing has already started just by seeing you here. Uh, so thank you for being in the house of God today. Uh, what a joy it is. I, I got up, looked at the bad weather, and I thought, man, I hope this doesn't knock some people out uh, of coming to church. So anyway, I'm glad it didn't. Glad you're here uh, and looking forward to all we have in store. I'm going to get out of your way shortly. Uh, this is the time of year where we run out of announcements. <laughs> We've got through Thanksgiving, we've got through fall, we've got through Christmas, uh, and here we are with nothing to do going into the new year. So that'll take about a week, and then this thing will fill back up. Uh, but a couple of things that I want to remind you of is that we're going to be uh, renewing our, our prayer list. So if there's somebody on here that needs to stay, put them on the list in the foyer. Another thing that I want to say to you is if you're visiting today, there's a tear out in your bulletin. We want you to fill that out for us. Drop it at the table on your way out. Uh, there'll be somebody back there with a gift for you uh, for doing that. So please do that if you've not done so, so that we'll have a record of your visit and we can get you that gift. I wanted to acknowledge a few groups. We've had a busy Christmas season. We had a lot going on around the church, uh, but we had a lot of participation in a lot of different things. One, I wanted to say, we, we put a parade float in the Farmable Christmas Parade this year, and our group showed up and showed out. And that's kind of our thing. <laughs> uh, we're, we're bad about doing that. It's showing up and showing out. And so we put a parade float with 60-something people in it. And we told all the kids, this is your one chance to legally throw things at people. And, uh, and they didn't disappoint. We made it rain. We had candy and footballs and bouncy balls and bracelets and stuff going everywhere. And, but what we also did is we passed out flyers for our revival. And we had a team walking beside the float passing out flyers. And that Sunday, I had a family here who came by and said, thank you for passing out those flyers. We came because of the flyer we got at the, at the parade. And I thought that was awesome. So I just wanted to say thank you to the ones who worked so hard on the parade float. So the week after the parade, we got a phone call that we did not expect because we didn't even know this was a thing to tell us that we got second place in the parade float contest that we didn't even know was going on. Amen. So I told them if we would have known, you know what I'm saying? So, so next year, 
It's going to be Clark Griswold come to Farmerville. Amen. That's, that's going to be the plan. But thank you to everybody who worked so hard to make the parade float possible because it was just a great representation of our church. And we had a wonderful time. And we all came back and had fellowship that night. And it was just really, really good. Uh, the second group that I wanted to say something to, and it's not as big of a group, but still a group that did a lot for our church, was we had the State Park Christmas drive through And they put up a display uh, for our church, for everybody who passed through to see uh, a Merry Christmas greeting from Antioch. And they did such a good job. Uh, and I, I judge this one. We got first place. Amen. <laughs> That's unofficial, unofficial. But thank you to those who did that. And and this is my last one. And I'll be out of your way until preaching time. Uh, Hats off to all who had a part and to all of our young people for the children's program last Sunday night. Outstanding. Blessed our hearts. They did such a good job. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who had a part in that as well. So let's give them a hand. This is like one of those political debates where they count the applause lines, you know? What did you get to get the applause? But I'm so proud of our people. It's been such a busy season and it all comes to this, this pinnacle right here where we celebrate and adore the birth of our salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for coming and for being a part of this today. Brother Ross is going to lead us. Our choir has some special music for us. And then if you'll hang around, I've got a message from the Word of God that I hope will bless your heart uh, and wish you a very Merry Christmas this year. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you, Jesus, for being good to us. Lord, thank you for the gift, Lord, of your life to come and, and, and not just lift it up, but to lay it down so that we might be saved. Lord, we come today... Uh, in the spirit of, of this Christmas season to say thank you, Jesus, for the great gift that you have given us in our salvation. Thank you for the son who was born, uh, Lord, to live his life and die for our sin, only to rise three days later and ever live, to hold our salvation in the palm of his hand. And, Lord, we recognize today that soon and very soon you're coming again. And, Lord, we look forward to that day. Bless us today and receive what we bring. I know many are tired. I know this year uh, has beat up a lot of our people. Uh, but, Lord, I know today we've come with the most sincere gift and offering of worship and praise that we can bring. And, Lord, I pray that you'll be glad and receive it today from our heart. Be magnified and glorified in this place and do what only God can do. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're excited for the choir to do a few songs for you. So y'all just sit back and enjoy as the choir sings a few songs. <clears throat> On a night more than 2,000 years ago in the little town of Bethlehem, a child was born to a poor young Jewish couple who had taken refuge in a place where animals were kept. He was wrapped in cloths and spent his first hour sleeping in a manger. We would have never have known his story except that this baby was royalty, sent from heaven because God knew the world needed to be rescued and he would be our perfect Savior King. We need a Savior.
that she would give birth to the long-awaited Messiah. But the angel had said to her, The Lord God will give the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end.
of his coming prayed to see them fulfilled but the messiah they imagined was so much less than all he would be and what they thought he came to do didn't even come close to what emmanuel god with us would truly mean the world waits for a miracle the heart longs for a little bit of hope oh come oh come in man Child prays for peace on earth, and she's calling out from a sea of earth. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. And can you hear the angels singing? Oh,
help us sing a little bit about Emmanuel. so much for that brother Ross for your leadership and for those who sang uh, they've been practicing for months getting ready for that did such an outstanding job I tell you what I look at all the bling bling in the crowd this morning and uh, I can't help but miss miss Rita would be happy amen <laughs> seeing all this all this shine amen to that we'll praise the Lord for it uh, if you have your Bibles this morning open with us to the gospel of Matthew chapter 2 Matthew's gospel in chapter 2 you know, we preached out of chapter 1 last week, and we talked about Joseph uh, before Jesus. And we talked about the life of Joseph and the experience that Joseph and Mary had uh, as they anticipated their marriage and, uh, and the Lord. And we're just going to kind of pick up uh, here in Matthew chapter 2. Oh, I got off, of, I got off my place there. Excuse me. Matthew, yeah. I was in Matthew 12. Excuse me. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Uh, in honor of his word as we read and then I got to tell my joke on Christmas then you can sit down for the next hour and a half <laughs> now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king behold there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying where is he that is born king of the Jews for we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, For thus it is written by the prophet, And now Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshiped him. And they had opened their treasures. They presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country 
another way. I want to preach a message to you this morning, uh, kind of in, in connection to where we ended last week, but I want to preach a message to you on the simple subject, Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We just want to stop and give you glory for the privilege we have to come today to worship you. Much like these wise men, we come today to say, Lord, we acknowledge that you are King and Lord of all. We thank you, Lord, for all you are, for all you do, for all that you have done. Lord, for all that you're still to do, for what you mean to each of us. And we recognize that it all started at a little place in Bethlehem, Lord, where you came into this earth, robed in flesh, to live for us, to die for us, to rise for us, so that you could come again one day and get us. Bless the service today. Be honored in this place. Thank you for this choir. Thank you, Lord, for the voice of the congregation, for all you've done. Now minister to our hearts. Your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you can be seated. You know, people say that Christmas is not about gifts. But in some respect, that's exactly what it's about. It's about the greatest gift that's ever been given. And what's interesting about gifts is that gifts oftentimes say more about the person receiving the gift than they do about the person who gives them. In this, I would never buy expensive jewelry for another woman. I buy the expensive jewelry, amen, at Walmart on the plastic aisle. Some of that pretty turquoise plastic for my wife. And so it would not be expected for me to give that kind of gift to another child as you're, or to another woman as your children grow. You have gifts that you give that are specific to your children, gifts that you would never give another child because they're not your children. In the very same sense, the Lord gave us this gift to express to us the love that he has for all humanity. And in giving that gift, now we respond and reciprocate in giving our gift to him. And that's exactly what the wise men did. They came to this place to seek out the Lord to give him gifts. And it's a very interesting thing when you consider what this was, was a gesture of their adoration. They came simply to acknowledge he is the Messiah. They came to say he is king. They came to say that he is Lord. By the way, that is exactly what we do when we gather in the Lord's house on the Lord's day, not only on Christmas, but for the rest of the year also, to come and say that Jesus Christ is king. He is Lord. He is our Savior. Just what Joseph said when they handed him last week. You remember that babe and he looked down and he named him Jesus, which means salvation, that our salvation has come. And so the wise men sought out the Lord to do uh, exactly that, to bring him gifts, to, to celebrate his coming, to adorn him with the pleasantries that they had, some of their finest uh, uh, things to give. They dug into their treasury and they gave sacrificial to the Lord uh, to minister to his coming and that's our heart today is to recognize the coming Lord and our coming King and so as you go through that text and you see these wise men I've seen it on church signs and and, and sell uh, uh, I don't know if it's a song title ever before but little lines one-liner type things that wise men still seek it <laughs> and that's what we're here to do today is to encourage you to continue to seek the Lord and do what God has called us to do. So I just want to identify the significance of the gifts that the wise men brought to the Lord that day. You read those three words with me as we got to the conclusion in verse 11 of Matthew chapter 2 where it talked about the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Now I went to school with a girl named Big Myrrh. That's different. Amen? <laughs> this is just myrrh. We'll get to that another sermon for another day. Amen? All right. <laughs> and so as we look at this this morning, I want us to consider what's represented in these three gifts. Number one, I want you to see this, that the gold represents and presents to you and me and to the world Jesus as potentate, Jesus as king. In many cultures, you could not and even still you won't and cannot approach a king without a gift. It's just customary when going before a king to bring a gift that's worthy of that experience to go to him. Them bringing the gifts to the Lord simply signifies that they came to acknowledge they knew he was king. 
They knew that this was the Messiah. They came with great expectation. They didn't come just like we don't come wondering if he's the Lord. We don't come today hoping that he's the Lord. We come knowing that he's the Lord today. And that's exactly how they approached this experience. They came to give gifts, not to hope he was who they longed for, but knowing that the gift of salvation had been given to this world and the people of God could be set free because of what Jesus did. The value of the gift speaks even more volumes uh, of what it meant what they brought that day. The gold, again, talks about the sincerity of the adoration that they brought to him that day. I'll say to you this, it was a fitting gift. You wouldn't come to a king uh, with a bunch of candy. You wouldn't come with a, to the king with some plastic Mardi Gras beads, amen? You, you come to the king with a gift that is worthy of his existence. And so they came before him with gold. This representing him as king. Not only was it a fitting gift, but it was a foretelling gift. They came this far with such a gift to recognize that this baby was the king. It was to tell the world this was the king. Remember, at this point, Jesus has done nothing except what newborn babies do. And anybody who's ever had a newborn baby knows it's not very kingly. Amen? They cry, they eat, they sleep, and they make messes. That's what babies do. Amen. That's all Jesus has done at this point. Jesus has just begun his life on this earth, and yet here they are coming to adore him as king. Why? It's to foreshadow something that they knew. Why did they know? Because of the scripture. They knew who he was. They knew what he had come to do, and they came to celebrate that on that day. So it was a fitting gift, but it was a foretelling gift. It was to tell the world and also to celebrate in their own knowledge exactly what the Bible says in Isaiah 9 and verse 6, that unto us a child is born, that he's come to be the Prince of Peace, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, and the government will be on his shoulder. And we praise the Lord for that. And so they came that day with this gift of gold to say, this is our king, a fitting gift, a foretelling gift, a foreordained gift. If you know this story, and I know that many of you, perhaps most of you do, what you'll find in the next verses of Matthew chapter 2 is an exodus, but quite opposite of the one that we saw in the book of Exodus, they went into Egypt. This is where Mary and Joseph have to respond to that old booger Herod. You remember Herod told the wise men, when you find him, I want you to tell me where he is so that I can come worship him. Insincere to say the least. His desire was to kill him. His desire was not to be challenged as king. And so Mary and Joseph would receive this from the wise men and the wise men would counsel them and they would leave and go to Egypt. Well, you know, as well as I do, a newly wed young couple with a newborn child doesn't have two nickels to rub together. So this was foreordained in the sense that the adoration and the, and the gift of their worship that was brought that day would not only recognize him as king, but it would provide for them to be able to go into Egypt and survive and get through this season of saving our Lord till he could come back and save us. Amen. Just like many of you and I have learned throughout our life, where God guides, he provides. And that's exactly what happened that day with the gift that was brought by these wise men. The gold presents Jesus to us as potentate. The frankincense presents Jesus to us as priest. Frankincense was a priestly gift. It was used in the temple. When they came to the temple to worship and to bring sacrifice to the Lord, when the sacrifices were being offered, frankincense would be put out in order to, to fill the room with a sweet-smelling aroma, one that would satisfy both God and man through the sacrificial process. And as they went through that, th this was a gummy type, almost like a sweet gum, that came from a tree in order to be used in this practice and this represents to us the high priest that Jesus Christ is for the believer and the scripture has much to say about this his priesthood is permanent his priesthood is one of permanency. He is a permanent high priest to his people. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 17 the Bible declares to us that he is priest forever. He will forever 
be our priest. He is our representation, our one who gives us access to the Father. His priesthood is permanent. Not only is it permanent, but his priesthood is powerful. His priesthood is very powerful. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Bible talks about this one man having offered this sacrifice for sin forever. is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What that means to me and you is that where the priest throughout the Old Testament tabernacle and temple days had to labor daily in offering sacrifices to satisfy the relationship between broken man and holy God, that Jesus came and he took all of that gift, all of that offering, all of that sacrifice, all of that position, and he laid it on the altar when he died on the cross so that we could have unlimited access to God. There will be no more offering, no more sheep, no more bullocks. There's no more office of priest. Jesus Christ is that stand between God and man. He has a powerful priesthood. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, this is some of my favorite, verse 24 and verse 25, that he has a priesthood that never changes. And that he, as our high priest, is able to save them to the uttermost who come unto him believing because he, as high priest, never ceases to be our priest. So he has this priesthood, never changing, so that we can be saved to the uttermost. That word uttermost there means completely and perfectly. Isn't that interesting? That an imperfect and incomplete people could receive such a perfect and complete gift as we have in the salvation of our God. His priesthood is permanent. His priesthood is powerful. And his priesthood is procuring. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16, we don't have a high priest that's not touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Are you hurting today? He has hurt. He hurts for you. He hurts with you. He's not been one who doesn't know our hurt. He has been touched. Moved, if you will, by the feeling of our infirmities. The Bible says there in Hebrew 4.15, he was in all points, in every way, tempted like as we are. But what qualifies a, a high priest is that he was able to do it without sin. So it invites us then, therefore, to come boldly to the throne of grace. That means confidently. How many of you are going to go to mama's house or your daddy's house or your brothers or sisters or mama or papa or whatever you call them, Mimi or Cuckoo or Juju, whatever. we got all these names now. How many are you going to go this afternoon or tomorrow and you're going to go in somebody's house and you're to eat? <laughs> Amen. And you're to fellowship and you're to get comfortable. Come on. And you're to enjoy yourself for these next couple of days. That's, that's comfort. That's confidence. I'm going to go to my mama's house this evening. Amen. And I'm going to do exactly that. And when we get there, I'm going to knock on the door and then I'm going in. And whatever's there is fair game. I'm not going to ask, can I have some of this? I ain't going to ask, can I have some more of that? Get out of the way. Daddy came to do work. Come on. We're finna get her done. Amen. <laughs> and so understanding that confidence level, it's talking about comfort. And, and the point that I guess I'm making here is with the gift of this frankincense, it reminds us of the position he has as our priest. And his position as priest, even though it is a huge office, a huge position, it's not one that we should approach formally, but it's one that we should approach comfortably because he has torn down all the barriers. That's what gives us the grace to come in here and saying, hey, come as you are. Amen. And come to Jesus. You don't have to fix it up. You don't have to clean it up. You don't have to dress it up. He already took care of that part. So come to Jesus. Let me tell you this. You can have on a tux and a cummerbund. They don't wear cummerbunds anymore. Y'all remember cummerbunds? It's kind of like a belly strap, you know? Cummerbunds. Amen. When they wore tuxedos and the cummerbunds and the tails and all the things, you remember that? That was for formals, all of that. But can I tell you this? You can have a, a, a three-piece suit on and still have a dirty heart. Come on. And you look like you got picked up on the side of the road and have a heart just as pure as, as anything. And, and that's all right. Amen. My point is, is that Jesus took care of the dirty work. He took care of the dress up. He put the crown of thorns on his head. He wore the cross. He took the shame. He took the reproach so that you and I would be without excuse to come to Jesus this morning. He took away all the qualifiers. The qualifier is this. It's like the old hymn says, just because he told me I could come, I'm coming. Amen. Just as I am, without one plea, except that his blood has been shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. 
I'm here by invitation. Isn't it, isn't it something when you show up somewhere and your name's on a list and they can't find it and then all of a sudden they find your reservation? You poke your chest out. I told you I was supposed to be here. I know I don't look like I'm supposed to be. Day Joe's like when we went down to uh, Squire Creek to play golf and you had a fish hook on your hat and I had a camouflage golf bag. We didn't look like we were supposed to be there, but we had a reservation. Amen. <laughs> Amen. We walked up in there and scattered balls all over that field down there. Had a big time. I'm telling you the truth. I'm thankful that you can come just as you are because Jesus came and took care of all the qualifiers. Jesus took care of all. We don't have a high priest that's not touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So let Hebrews 4, 16, let us therefore come boldly, confidently, courageously, comfortably to his throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. And find grace to help us in a time of need. The gold represents Jesus to me and you as our potentate. The frankincense represents Jesus to you and me as our high priest. Again, a priesthood that is permanent. A priesthood that is powerful. A priesthood that is procuring. He has procured for you and me access. Who did not deserve it. Into the presence of a holy God. So we come to worship. Oh, come let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Not only did the gold and frankincense have their representation, but the myrrh presents Jesus to us as our propitiation. He come to give the gift. He came, rather, to give the gift of sacrifice. He came to atone for our sin. He came to satisfy the law of God. Myrrh was a substance used to embalm. He was born. Oh, it was triumphant, was it not? The, the, the triumph of his entry, the shepherds. Isn't it interesting how God always, it seems, uses the obscure things of this world to, to do wonderful, triumphant things for this world? It's amazing to me how of all of the scholars of the day, of all of the minds and all of the Pharisees and all of the scribes, that he called a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors to be his disciples. Isn't it interesting of all the heralded streets and, and temples and places of worship that he could have gone to announce his son's coming, he went out into the middle of a pasture and told a bunch of old boys like me and you, the Lord is coming. They look up and saw those angels and whew, it was on. Amen. What an entry. Jesus was born triumphantly. To come in heralded by the angels, adored by the wise men, kings, and, and, and powers of the world sought to see him and to meet him and to find him, some to even kill him. But it's needless to say his birth was an incredible event in the calendar of human history. But the sad truth, yet necessary truth, is that his birth was for only one purpose. And that was for him to die. You and I were born to live, even though death often interrupts it. You and I were born to live, and live we have and live we shall until that day comes. Jesus was born for one purpose, and that was to die. He came again, the gift of myrrh, as our propitiation. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Second John, or rather 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he says, Little children, I have not written this to you so that you would sin, but that you would sin not. But if any man does sin, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who's not only the propitiation for our sin, but is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. He came to die. That myrrh was a representation of our propitiation. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. He took the sting away. He took away the penalty. And though you and I one day will tragically go to sleep, the Bible says in John chapter 11, verse 25, whosoever liveth and believeth on him shall never die. Shall never die. I want to say this, not to stir emotion, but our church has lost several this year. A handful just recently. 
Can I say to you, they are more alive this morning than we ever saw them on this earth. Because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. Oh, when death rallied its troops, and when death sounded its march, and when death came closing in and the dark, uh, darkness began to gather and the light began to fade, just as death moved in for its final blow, everything gave way to life by the power of God because Jesus took the sting of death, Jesus took the bite of the grave, and we have nothing ahead of us but life and life everlasting because of this gift of propitiation that you and I have in Jesus. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Christ the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Mess around and preaching here on Christmas Eve. Come on now. Woo. Huh. Huh. Their gift spoke volumes of his importance and significance to us all, which begs this question. What have we given him? And what are we going to give him? What we see here is the Highest of offerings that they brought to acknowledge his lordship. What have I given and what shall I give? What have we given and what shall? There's an old song that has a line in it. What shall a beggar give to a king? What is it? that we give him today. Christmas lists are a big thing. I see people where they have these Christmas lists and they can send them to the North Pole and, and get a response. Amen? And many of you are preparing for that great deliverance, amen, of all of those things, or at least a portion, or hopefully the favorite things, or the, or the most sought after things, right? And then some of us see those lists and go, ha, wait till you get grown and pay for it yourself. Come on. Amen. But that Christmas list is a thing. I think we all ask people, what do you want for Christmas? You ask your spouse, what do you want for Christmas? Men, we learned that lesson the hard way, have we not? Amen. What do we want for Christmas? What do we ask them for Christmas? Well, what would Jesus say this morning? They brought him that day gold and frankincense and myrrh. But if Jesus himself were here this morning and we were to ask him, Lord, what could we give you for Christmas? What gifts would you have us to give? Well, I want to give you a few that I think we can designate in Scripture that we could all give Jesus this morning. First of all, I want you to know Jesus wants your heart. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 26, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. He not only wants your heart this morning, if you've not given Jesus your heart, but for all of us, whether lost or saved, I want you to know beyond just your heart, Jesus wants your life. He wants you to give him your life. And what's interesting is he does not need my life. So he's not asking for my life for his own benefit or gain. He's asking for my life because he loves me enough to know that he knows what's best for me. So I give him my life so that he can give me his best. Who wouldn't do that? Who wouldn't take that deal? Son, give me your heart. Give me your life. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and verse 6 tells us to trust the Lord with all of our heart and lean not under our own understanding. In all of our ways acknowledge him and he'll direct thy path. That means he wants more than your hour on Sunday. Amen. Antioch might want your hour on Sunday. <laughs> but Jesus wants your life. And let me say this. He paid the price to deserve it. And yet, where he could demand it and force it, he invites you to give it. What a Savior. Come, let us adore him. What is his Christmas list? Your heart. Your life and your love. Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, the Bible says, And then, or rather they, thou, I'm sorry, shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. But don't forget, when that sounds like a, a tall order, <laughs> that 1 John 4, 19 tells us we only love him because he first loved us. How could we withhold what he desires from us when he has so freely given us everything we need? Such a picture in these gifts that these wise men had brought to just simply remind us that you and I all have a gift 
that we can give the Lord. And it won't cost you anything that you can't get rid of to give him your heart. It won't cost you anything that you're going to miss if you give him your life. It won't cost you anything, amen, to give him your love because of what he has already done for us. How much did he love us, you say? John chapter 3 and verse 16 makes it clear. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth that him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? What is an only begotten son? What does that mean? Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 made it very clear. For unto us, the gift that was given, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. <clears throat> a man named John Francis Wade, author of this incredible hymn that we sing at Christmas, was run out of England in 1745. He was a layman in Lancashire, but because of persecution arising from rebellion, streams of people fled to France and Portugal where communities of English-speaking believers would appear. But how could he, a refugee, support himself? In those days, it said that printing musical scores was cumbersome and copying them by hand was an art. In the famous college and ministry center of Dewey, France, Wade taught music and became renowned as a copyist of musical scores. His work was exquisite, the writer said. In 1743, Wade, at 32 years old, had produced a copy of a Latin Christmas carol beginning with the phrase, Adeste Fideus Latus Triumphantus. At one time, historians believe that he simply discovered an ancient hymn and by an unknown author, but most scholars now believe that Wade himself composed these lyrics. Seven original handmade copies or hand-printed copies of the manuscript of this Latin hymn have been found, all of them bearing Wade's signature. John Wade passed away 8, uh, August 16, 1786 at the age of 75. His obituary honored him for his beautiful manuscripts that adorned chapels and homes around that region. At the time of his passing, an English believer began, or English rather believers began returning to Britain and they carried Wade's Christmas carol with them. More time passed and one day an Anglican minister named Reverend Frederick Oakley, who preached at the Margaret Street Chapel in London, England, came across Wade's Latin Christmas carol. Being deeply moved, he translated it to English for the Margaret Street Chapel. The first line of Oakley's translation said, Ye faithful, approach ye. Somehow, you faithful approach ye didn't catch on, and several years later, Oakley tried again. By this time, Oakley's grasp of Latin had improved because he had repeated over and over the Latin phrase, Adeste Fideus Latus Triumphantus, because he had repeated it over and over. He finally came up with a simpler, more vigorous, O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, living a hundred years apart, writing in two different nations, these two men combine their talents to bid us come joyful and triumphant and adore him born the king of the angels. O come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ, Christ the Lord. Father, I thank you today for being so good to us. Whew. What a gift you have given. Lord, to save our souls, to give us life and life more abundant. But Lord, beyond this, to give us eternal hope. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we come today to adore you and to say thank you for the great gift that you've given. Lord, as we recognize the wise men who came and the gifts that they gave and what they point us to in our king, our high priest, the great sacrifice that would be paid for the offering for our sin. Lord, I recognize today that there are still gifts that we can bring. And Lord, we recognize this morning that you, above all, came to seek and to save that which was lost. So God, if there's one here in this room, and there has to be in a number this size, 
someone here who's never been saved, born again of the Spirit of God, I pray today they'd give Jesus their heart. Lord, let them come and be gloriously saved. It'd be the greatest Christmas gift. I, I say this, I speak on behalf of our people. None of us will get a greater gift this year than to see someone give their life to Jesus in this service. God, if there's one here that needs to be saved, I pray that they'd come and give their heart to Jesus. Lord, for we who have been saved or for those who might be saved in this service, let us recognize that that great privilege of being saved comes with the opportunity to surrender our life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, to say with the hymnist of old, wherever he leads, I'll go. Lord, let us give you our life today. And Lord, we've come to recognize that we love you and to say one more time, God, we give you the gift of our love because you first loved us. Lord, save the lost in this room. Lord, call us who are saved to a closer walk and a greater degree of dedication and surrender. And Lord, help us to remember above all things to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all of our strength. And Lord, I believe if we do, these will be gifts worthy of the great thing that you did for us on that Christmas morning by sending your son to come and be born in a manger to live and die for our sin, who's still alive today, soon coming to receive us unto himself. Bless this invitation. It's not mine. This is not Antioch's. This is not a denominational invitation. This is simply an extension of an invitation from heaven this morning. For those who have been ministered to by the word of God who need to get something done to get it done right here and right now. Just as boldly as we can come to that throne of grace, I pray people feel just as comfortable and just as welcome to come to this altar this morning and do business with God. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Y'all stand with me. Don't get bound up with Christmas. We're here to have church. Amen. This altar's open if you need to come.